Buenas tardes todo mundo, bienvenidos a la, a la sesión eh, de la tarde de, esta, de este día. Eh, la siguiente charla está a cargo de Luis Rocha, de University of Indiana, la Universidad de Indiana. El título es Towards Understanding the Multilevel Complexity on Human Health from Drug, Drug Interaction to Human Reproduction Cycles. Right, thank you very much. Um, yo no voy a hablar en español porque solo hablo portuñol. Um, so I will speak in English. Um, uh, thank you very much for the organizers to, to the organizers for inviting me to come here. Uh, I've been wanting to visit Mexico City for a long time. Unfortunately, I'm only here a day and a half, but I'll have to come back at another time. <clears throat> All right, so. Um, I'm at Indiana University, and I'm also at the uh, Gulbenkian Institute in Portugal. And uh, the research I'm going to show actually involves both institutions. Um, let me start by thanking my group uh, first, uh, especially the students who are involved. Well, the top row are students who already left the group, but of the current ones that are involved in the research would be mostly Ian Wood and Rion Correa. Um, And so the, the work that I'm going to show next um, is uh, based on their work. Um, before that, may, maybe just say a few words in the guise actually of interaction, since this is a complexity center. Um, you know, so a little advertisement. We have this a big NSF training grant on complex systems and networks that I'm the director of. That's why I can't stay more than tomorrow, actually. And I wanted to advertise for those who are interested in, or know anyone who wants to do a PhD in this area, uh, in a sort of slightly different environment. The, the gist of what we do at Indiana is that you have a dual PhD degree. You get a degree in complex networks and systems, and then another PhD in, say, sociology, political science, economics, physics, and so forth. So that's the, the basis of our training. We have a lot of international uh, systems, uh, um, universities and centers that we collaborate with, so C3 might be a place that we should add to this list. It's too small to see here how it's working um, to do this. It's, it is the only NSF-funded training grant on complex networks and systems in the whole of the United States, so it's a, it's a big deal and we're very happy um, with that. Um, if you want to know more information, that's the website uh, for it. And the deadline just passed was January 1st, but for next year, it will be January 1st uh, again. So, uh, so that you can know and you have time to, to, to think about it. That's, we are right now in the admissions for this. All right, um, let me go to the proper research. So I, in this center on the conference on, on complexity, I don't need to justify why it's important to look at the multi-level complexity. In particular, when it comes to human health, um, It is something that uh, a lot of us know, know about, but it, it doesn't seem even at lunch, you're just having these conversations now about how much the behavior of a human being depends on levels that go all the way from the molecular to the, to the organ level, to the body level, to the society, to the culture, and even to the moral levels that constrain it. That's what we were talking about over lunch. So this affects health a lot, actually. And so my research group is focusing on all these levels, and I'm going to talk about two of them here. We have ongoing work all the way from gene regulatory uh, networks in systems biology, particular controllability of networks that we work. I'm not going to talk about that. We also work on analyzing with text mining with the whole of the scientific literature, uh, electronic health records, and so forth. What I'm going to focus today is our work using social media to understand some aspects of, of health and also electronic health records um, at the end. But I'm happy to talk about our research at uh, in the other levels um, if you're interested. So let me start by talking about social, social media and a particular case uh, that has to do with, uh, with health. So the work I'm going to talk now uh, was a collaboration with uh, Joanna Sa, a colleague of mine at the Gulbenkian Institute, and also Johan Bolen at Indiana University. And it's part of the thesis of Ian Wood, which was a student in my group. And so the question that Joanna actually first started asking was, what drives human reproduction cycles that have been observed? And I will tell you a little more about that. 
Um, this research uses the data from birth records, from uh, Google, Google Trends, and also analyzing mood sentiment on Twitter. Uh, so we used all of that to, to, to deal with this problem. So let me tell you a little about, about human reproduction cycles. You might not know about them. I didn't know about them until we, I started working on this area. Uh, many animals, in particular mammals, have an adaptation or we think it's an adaptation of birth cycles in which they um, uh, ha somehow th those peaks of reproduction have to do with the winter solstices and so forth. And something in, in humans has been observed too, but mostly restricted to uh, n northern countries and also western culture countries. So it is known that there's a peak of births in September, at the end of September and early of October. Um, this has been known for a while, and there's a lot of the literature on that. Um, and this has been, there are two uh, hypotheses about this, but mostly the, the one, the main hypothesis, of the peak of conceptions happens around the winter solstice, which also in northern Christian countries coincides with Christmas or very near Christmas. Right? So people have thought that there is some kind of biological adaptation to, uh, to the solar cycles, in which is when the days are shorter, and it's colder and so forth. So this, what you see here on this picture is um, the birth data for about uh, a few countries in the north, Austria, Canada, in the nor uh, Western countries in Europe and North America. And you have the birth data uh, and in the red line you see Christmas and the birth data is blue shaded and it's tilted nine months. So it's nine months later. So you can see that if there is a peak of concept uh, of births that has to do nine months later with the peak of conceptions around Christmas or the winter solstice. So this is this has been known and recorded, and people have talked about this for for a number uh, of years. So the question remains: What's causing this? Is it because it's Christmas, or it's because it's the um, so it's a cultural element, or is it because? there is um, a biological adaptation. So if it were a biological adaptation to the solar cycles, you would expect a behavior somewhat like this, uh, that the northern hemisphere countries would behave in a certain way and the southern hemisphere countries would behave in counter cycle. So six months later, that's when they should have the, 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 the peak birth, in births and, and also conceptions. Or it could be cultural. So if there's a cultural hypothesis, uh, you would expect countries of a similar culture to be behaving in the same way. And so these are the Christ mostly predominantly Christian countries, and then maybe the predominantly Muslim countries would behave differently. They would not behave the same way. And so how do you go about showing that? Unfortunately, uh, accurate birth data is not available in all the countries to resolve this. That's why the, the leading a hypothesis is the biological one, but when you look at this, the countries that we have very good data, uh, in addition to a few in the south here, do not allow you to discriminate between the two, the two, the two hypotheses. They're basically centered there, except as we will see, we do have data for Australia, Chile, and South Africa, and so forth, that will allow us to do some of this. So we approach this from a data science perspective. Um, this sort of social, bi social biology question, and, um, and went to look at, uh, at Google Trends. So we had to track not just births, but also online interest in sex. And so what we do is go on Google Trends and search for, uh, and I'll tell you in detail how we do this, for sex. For now, for now just to say, this black line has to do with interest in sex as it goes on Google Trends. And you can see that in Christmas, there's a huge peak in Christmas for all these, the same countries that I have the birth data that I showed you earlier. In fact, here, just, oppos just opposing the Google trend data with the birth data tilted nine months later, uh, uh, you can see that the peaks of birth that we observe in September coincide nine months, nine months later of the interest in sex on Google at around Christmas, on the Christmas week. This is weekly data. So let me unpack a little of the research we did here a little more. So this is the online interest in sex. Uh, so how, how do we track this? In, um, so it turns out this is a side result of our paper, which came out just last December. It's a very recent paper. 
that interest in sex can be tracked on in Google sex just by looking at the word sex it, itself. I mean, we've had a lot of reviewers that didn't believe this, but if, so we have this big table uh, in the supplementary materials of the paper that show the five most, com most associated words with the word sex in all the local languages and in English too. It turns out actually searching for sex in English in almost every country is very correlated to searching it uh, in the local language. So most people in men, most countries search for sex uh, using English. Some notable exceptions are Brazil, for instance, which is a huge country. People do search for sex there in Portuguese uh, more often. Uh, but so, for instance, here you can see in Spain what are the most uh, uh, words. Here you see the correlations of searching in the local language and in English. But we search in both the local language and in English. And there's no doubt that just looking for the word sex really shows you a lot of interest in pornography. Not exclusively pornography, but mostly pornography, but also people wanting to know about sex in, in general. So that, that is, that's what we get from the Google Trend data. Um, so the Google Trend data, we do not get actual absolute numbers of the searches. We get a normalized score that Google Trends provides, which is the proportion of all, of all searches, search terms, how much the, the search for sex takes of that proportion. So what's happening really in Christmas is that people are searching a lot more for sex than other terms than they usually do in other times of the year. So it's not an absolute increase. So this is normalized. So it's not a question of there's more overall volume in Christmas. It's a qu because it's normalized for that, okay? It's also not a question of, oh, I mean, many people say that. Uh, uh, it's just because people in Christmas have more time, they're on vacation, therefore they're searching for pornography online. Well, we compare that to very similar uh, holidays in other countries. So for instance, in the United States, Thanksgiving has about the same time off that, that you have over Christmas. So schools are out for a whole week. Uh, universities are out. People are actually out of work often more time than in Christmas because it goes from Thursday to Sunday, whereas Christmas, if it falls on a weekend, you kind of have only two days. Um, and so, and we also looked at other countries uh, in Easter. So here you have Christmas in the United States and the blue line is Thanksgiving and the red line is, um, is Christmas and also we track the 4th of July. And you can see that the peaks in Christmas are, are higher. I'll tell you a little about the summer peaks too, and we'll observe that th those are also a known phenomenon that we'll talk about. But clearly the, the Christmas ones are systematically higher than Thanksgiving, which has a similar amount of time. We also looked at other countries for Eastern in Europe, uh, Easter, also schools are out, uh, out uh, and people usually have a whole week or two off from work in France and in Germany. And we look, this is France where we're tracking Easter. We also tra tracking Bastille Day, which is July 14th, which is also sort of uh, a celebration there. And Christmas really has a different pattern and the same uh, for Germany and so forth. So it's not just a matter of extra time and extra volume around Christmas. So going by these online searches, these are the same countries I showed you earlier um, for the Northern Hemisphere. If you, nor if you average all of that, you see the, the big peaks in Christmas. And there's this wider peak in the summer, not, a, not a, such a steep peak as in Christmas, but in the, in the summer. And I'll get back to that in a little bit. Now let's look at the Southern Hemisphere countries for which we have birth data. So we only found good birth, we, good weekly birth data for Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and South Africa. And that's what you see here in the blue shaded area, um, also tilted nine months later, so to match the curse. And you can see clearly they have a birth peak in September too, even though they're in the Southern Hemisphere. So you'd exp that counter cycle that you would expect does not happen. So in September, they have the same peaks in, uh, peaks in sync as the Northern Hemisphere, which seems to undermine the biological hypothesis that existed earlier. Um, so, um, other things. So, one of the, one of the things we want to take away is that to impress upon you that looking at Google Trend data for interest in sex is a good surrogate for these peaks in interest in sex 
for countries that you may not have birth data. So where we have birth data, they match. And in fact, they even match the summer behavior that was already known. This is a paper from 1999, only in the United States. And you can see the births in September due to Christmas and the wider sort of peak that happens in from summertime too. And if you can see here, the Google trend data also has this than it has, and also, and the very steep peak. So this is good ammunition that maybe we can use this instead of birth um, records for the countries that we don't have in order to study interest in sex, because in the countries where we do have, they kind of um, um, match. All right, so there's a great match between birth and sex interest data where available. So we're going to take this further to the countries where we do not have birth data to try to look at the cultural hypothesis. So these are the countries where we have birth data that is good, that's only the blue ones, and we, are not, not, we don't have any on the Muslim countries that would allow us to do that cultural hypothesis to test. So that's why we're looking um, at sex search. So in order to look at whether it's cultural or biological, we don't rely on, on the on the Google Trend data. So, um, you know, this is, this is just the point that I made. For the green countries, we do not have any data. So we used the, the Google Trend data for that. So we looked at 129 countries, all the Google Trend data from uh, 129 countries. We tracked their location, whether they're in the northern or the southern hemisphere, and whether their main religion was Christian, predominantly religion was Christian, Muslim, or other. So by, we, we didn't do any judgment value. We went on the UN census and say, what are the, the if a country said that 50% more, 50 of more of the population define themselves as Christian, we considered them Christian. So for instance, there's some interesting cases that you see like the Netherlands is not considered a Christian country because more than 50% do not uh, tell themselves, to, to report not being Christian. Uh, same from Czech Republic and Estonia, so, so for instance. Um, so then we look at the Google Trend data um, and aggregate it for these groups of countries. The red line are the, uh, the, um, the Christian countries, the green line, the Muslim countries, and you have data from January of 2004 to January 14, so 10 years worth of data. And Christmases are the red lines, and then you can see clearly there's this pattern, in, respective of the hemisphere, that there's a peak uh, for in Christmas time, right? And then uh, for the Muslim countries, you have a completely different pattern. It doesn't have peaks in Christmas. They have slight a peak, but you you also um, tracking countries that have sizable Christian populations as well uh, that uh, in, in some of this data. But there is a very different pattern than this. There's a strikingly different pattern in Ramadan. So the green bars that you see there is during the weeks of Ramadan. And an interesting thing about Ramadan is that it follows a lunar calendar, so it changes every year of, of, of a different position. So unlike Christmas, that follows the solar calendar, it's always around the solar solstice, Ramadan actually switches every year according to the solar. So we can see that pattern tracks the culture, not the, the planet, right? So that's, that's a, um, a clear implication for the cultural hypothesis. So to, when you average this, then you come with sort of an eigen pattern that captures Christianity in terms of sex searches or countries that are Christian and countries that are Muslim in terms of how they search for sex. And clearly Ramadan is very interesting because there's a tremendous drop during Ramadan on searches for sex, which is not surprising because it's a time of abstinence. So you have a very cult, a big cultural drop in, in searches for sex online. And the peak that you observe is at Eid al-Fitr, which is the end of Ramadan, when Ramadan is over and there's a family celebration, very much like Christmas, where people give uh, presents to children and, and food and so forth. It's a very similar cultural celebration to Christmas that happens at the end of Ramadan. And so that's a very distinguishing feature from all countries. So what we did in the paper here is to say, if we were to predict what the predominant culture of a country is by this eigenvector without knowing, how would we do as a classifier system? So if I'm just going, I'm going to look at, at your country's sex search patterns. If it's close to this, 
I'll predict that it's Christian. If it's close to this, I predict that it's Muslim. How well would we do in predicting a country's religion just by their sex patterns of searches on Google? And it turns out we do very well, actually. I mean, this is just a pattern for other countries uh, that I should show, like China, Japan, a lot of countries that are neither Christian or Muslim, so they don't have any pattern like this. Uh, in collectively, individually, they have other patterns. So to detect that, we're going to do this classification that I just told you about based on these, um, these patterns. So by the way, if it were biological, you'd expect the blue countries here to have this pattern, but six months later. So this would not predict them correctly. And, uh, uh, and so we, we use these to predict. Uh, and so here you show, this is our prediction. So this is the pr our prediction of based just on your Google trend sex search patterns for that country, what will be your religion? And you can see that is pretty correct. These are the Z scores. Um, in terms of data, so we predicted countries that were Christian correctly 80% of the time when they have increased sex search around Christmas. 80% though, this has a, that I have to unpack this as something you can find the details in the supporting materials. This includes Orthodox Christian countries. And Orthodox Christian countries do not celebrate on December 25th. They celebrate on January 6th. Uh, and there's, if we remove those, the prediction would be 91%. If we remove Orthodox countries, it would be 91%. Also, Spain has a strange pattern. I'm not sure if in Mexico, I don't think so. But in Spain, they actually have the main celebration on January 6th, even though they're not Orthodox. That's the King's Day. And so they, Spain also, you can see here on the data, has a pretty light Z-score. It still comes as Christian, but it's a lighter score than other countries because of that. But still the prediction is quite good. Uh, but if you predict by December solstice, only 56% of the countries get well predicted. So it's not so much the December solstice, but it's uh, increased taxes and uh, search, uh, ser searches. The same thing for Muslim countries, we predict, predict correctly 77% of the time. Um, uh, it's interesting, you can see all the details in the supporting materials. The countries that fail predictions are countries uh, in either way, sort of like Bosnia and Herzegovina, and countries that have very balanced Christian and Muslim populations. They have both patterns coexisting, and this analysis does not predict it. Uh, the errors also include the Netherlands and Czech Republic and, and, and Slovenia that were not classified as Christian to begin with, but follow the same sex search pattern because people still celebrate Christmas, even, even if not religiously. Um, I, uh, one of the, one of, from this table, let me just say one more thing. It's very interesting about the Southern Hemisphere. The, most of the Southern Hemisphere um, is, is, is Christmas. So they have, the, we corrected 95% of the countries in the Southern Hemisphere that have a sex uh, peak in Christmas, we correct 95% correctly those. And, uh, and, um, and, and so that, that is also uh, more ammunition for our South Northern Hemisphere um, uh, debunking of that hypothesis. So, all right, so with this research, we show that Online searches for sex peak around Christmas in culturally Christian countries, irrespective of Johannesburg location. And online searches, searches for sex peak around Eid al Fitr in predominantly culturally Muslim countries. So this sort of um, says that it is really a cultural phenomenon, not a biological adaptation like you see with other. Uh, uh, um, sure. It's like you said, I mean, basically Ramadan changes in time, but so does Easter, right? I mean, it's fixed yeah. at the lunar, not the solar, so, uh, we, we, and, so, and Thanksgiving doesn't also, yes, but also we, changes. I mean, the thing is that you saw that broad peak in the summer, I mean, that would very logically be associated with people take summer holidays, not, some, not holidays in September, October, or et cetera, et cetera, but you would expect it to be spread out just because well, people are taking a summer holiday, but not everybody goes uh, yeah. away on the first two weeks of August so, as they tend to do in uh, France. So let me say, so the time is obviously an enabling characteristic, but it's not a defining characteristic because Thanksgiving and Easter 
we track them not just as an average, but in the year in which they occur, and they don't have the sex peaks that you observe, nor, nor do they have as much birth record when, when, when birth data is, is, is known. So even th that was already known uh, in, in the United States, for instance, in that research I showed you earlier here that showed the peaks. There's no point, there's a Christmas peak, and there's clearly um, a, a summer sort of broader interest but there's not something like that for thanksgiving or for easter did, did you see the peak in uh, in the netherlands at uh, christmas yes we do right Actually, but then but as you said it's not a christian country i mean in the sense of people don't define I mean, the themselves research, as the christian, research right? is not uh, the research is not about it, it's not this is happening because it's christian it's just that it's a cultural celebration so in in the netherlands people still meet and give presents to one another and so whether they believe in God or not, it's not the point here. It's just that it's a, a, a cultural celebration. I actually didn't bring it here. We did have a slide specifically with Netherlands. I have it in my computer if you want to see. And that data, is, I think, is also in our support uh, uh, material. But people still are off on Christmas time. And, and our answer is that they have a, a specific mood, which is where I'm going to go next with this. So it's not just a matter of time. I think the, the issue of time, the best I can say this, it's certainly an, an enabling feature, but it's not the defining one when you look at all these other uh, celebrations. Um, okay, let me see where I was. So the question was, so what is so special about Christmas and Eid that causes this. That's the next answer to question we try to have by looking at mood. So we try to do an independent measurement of these populations, not on Google Trends, but on Twitter. So try to see. So we measure the same countries, uh, but uh, independently from the measurement from um, um, from Google Trends. So for the in this case. We used uh, the, a new tool for, for sentiment analysis. It's the effective norms for English words, which is a, a dictionary of terms that are supposed of about a thousand words. And each word has been rated by psychologists in human tests as to whether they have a particular loading, a psychological loading in three dimensions. So they have these three dimensions of arousal, dominance, and valence. Valence is the easiest one to understand. It goes from unhappy to happy. So certain words have a happy, supposedly, disposition or an unhappy one. Uh, you know, killing is unhappy, mother is happy, that sort of thing. Um, then you have dominance, control, to in which has this thing of how much in control you feel or how much controlled by others you feel. And arousal goes from very calm disposition to very excited disposition. Okay, so we measure these three dimensions um, on Twitter. But for those of you who like data, just to say how much we used, um, Indiana University has a 10% sample, sample of all tweets uh, called the garden hose that goes from 2010 to 2014. So that's the, use, the, the data that we used. We follow seven countries for which we had enough tweets that were geolocated. These are the, the number of tweets that were used for each country. So in the end, we processed 45 billion tweets, but on, uh, only 118 millions of, of those had geolocated um, uh, information, which is what we use for these countries um, that we had enough uh, to do. All right, so in terms, in terms of this dictionary, bear in mind that we removed from this, there's a huge table of several pages in the supporting materials of the paper, all holiday greetings. So we're not counting when you go on Twitter and say, Merry Christmas. That is not having effect on the loading. Even the word Christmas itself is not having, happy is not, happy Christmas is all, all those words are removed. So the, the signal that we are expressing, so even remove like Feliz Asturias Day, because uh, we track this in Spanish and Portuguese and in English. So we went on this database of all, the, of all the celebrations in every country and we removed the traditional greetings that are used so that to see that's not the bias of why people are feeling that mood um, on, on Twitter. We are measuring it from other words, not those words. Okay, so that's how we did the pre-processing. And then we did something, I'm not going to um, speak in detail about this. I'm happy if we have time, I can describe more. We have this thing we call eigenmoods, which basically uses the singular value decomposition of the time series of all the mood uh, um, 
and uh, of the mood variables in time. Uh, so basically, principal component analysis in time that we did uh, to try to find out what we call eigenmoods that describe particular situations. Um, so what you see here is the eigenmood for the United States that was uh, uh, discovered as being most indicative of the mood at Christmas. And uh, these plots show uh, time here on the horizontal axis, the, the line in, it's centered on Christmas, so you have all the 52 weeks of the year. And then here you have the valence, in, which is the unhappy to happy bin, so unhappier to happier. And what you see uh, in Christmas time is a move, you see the red bands, towards happier bins on both of these eigenvectors that we found for Christmas, or more correctly, singular vectors. So there's a, a move from lower bins to higher bins in valence in Christmas. In general, people are happier. Um, so, and this is not, um, uh, this is after removal of Merry Christmas and Happy Christmas and all of those things. Um, and so then we show, so if you see, in the part, the two, the biplot of the two eigenvectors, you see that all the Christmas of the four years we analyzed clustered together, so they have a similar mood. And then there are a few other weeks that are close to that. Sometimes New Year's is close to Christmas; it tends to be. And there are other weeks that are not not of particular uh, notice. There's no holiday in them that have a similar mood in that week. And so we went to see: could it be that these weeks? that don't have holidays on them are also more, there's more sex searches on those because they have this mood. And that's where we did a correlation. And the correlation is, is pretty decent for this type of work in which you have a, an R squared of 0.38. Yes, indeed, as you, this is the, the sex volume on Google Trends. This is how close you are to that eigen mood. And on average, the closer you get to the eigen mood, the more sex searches you have. Of course, when there's the factor of time could play a role here. So if we go and discount the time, these two that are on top would probably come down. New Year's Eve people are off too. But there's this result seems to show that there is a mood that is statistically correlated with more interest in sex on the internet, whether it's a holiday or not a holiday. Um, this is the data for both the United States and Brazil in the south, southern hemisphere. So we did search in Portuguese too in Brazil. And in Brazil it has the same things. You have the happiness and you also have a move to more calm builds, uh, uh, bins. So uh, arousal goes towards calmer bins. So people in addition to feeling happier seem to be feeling calmer around Christmas. And the correlation uh, also exists with Brazil. Uh, even higher actually. So, The bands are the typical, so these are the weeks before Christmas. This is sort of how normally it is. Twitter is like this, but then you can clearly see that Christmas is different in terms of this eigenvector. This, eigen, this type of mood is enhanced at Christmas. Uh, that, that's the best. So it's pretty stable throughout the year, and except in a few other weeks, and there was another week here around the summer where it shows up again, for instance. So this mood once in a while manifests itself, higher and so that's what you feel. But normally, that's, it's not manifest that way. So this technique we have of, of this, this I, a spectral decomposition of moods allow you to, to distinguish and peel away certain moods. So these are, so if it's dark green, it's, redre it's reducing that mood. So these bins have been more removed than normal. And these are bins are overemphasized, so that's what the columns. Thank you for asking because that was not clear before. Here you see the opposite. You see in the, uh, it going to lower arousal uh, in Brazil. Okay, so that's actually. I mean, this eigenmood technique is something that is in the supporting materials of this paper. We we have a, a paper coming, and it's from the dissertation of Ian Wood. This that is about to come that explains more this methodology, not just on this sex search paper, but in other, um, in other um, situations. So, so, so um, you know, be tuned to that. In Indonesia, so this is the data for Indonesia, we also have a, a move to valence around Eid al-Fitr, so now this is not Christmas, as Eid al-Fitr, and you also have a move to neither being in control or control 
or it's very neutral. So you're not feeling controlled by others or, or you're not controlling others uh, in our own EDL theater. And he actually has a pretty good correlation. I really like in this plot, as you can see, the Ramadan weeks are completely out of it, completely outliers that people have very low sex search, sex search volume and it does not have this mood. It's pretty far away from this mood. And then the mood manifests itself at the very end of Ramadan and people are happy and have the family celebrations and so forth. So basically I would say when this eigenmood is present, uh, sex search volume tends to increase and there's a shift to happy and, and mid-dominance and so forth in Indonesia. So this eigenmood correlation is a di additional omen, uh, ammunition for the cultural hypothesis. It's not just a matter of time, it's not just a matter of birth. There is a specific mood that is maximized at these celebrations that seems to be correlated with an interest in sex. Um, so in general, just ask one more question. Sure. So the thing is that makes it sound like it's causal, right? I mean, have you actually done the looked at the timing of one versus the Yes, we've done that, a Granger uh, causality analysis, but it's not on this paper. It's a forthcoming paper. As far as, as, far as uh, so I'm saying there's a correlation, that there's a mood that manifests itself at, around those areas. It could be that people are happy because they're having more sex, right? So, so we did look at a Granger causality analysis points to the other direction, that it's the mood that causes, and it's significant. And that's coming on the Ian's dissertation and in that other paper I was telling about. It didn't fit this one anymore. Uh, uh, the, um, so we, we, we did it afterwards, and, um, and so it will come out in another paper. So to summarize this, um, the sex search patterns that we've been observed are we, we giving, I th we think, very strong ammunition for a cultural hypothesis for these uh, because they correlate with these distinct mood patterns. Um, as I said, the Granger, I have here the slide for the Granger causality, but that's forthcoming work about to come out. So why this? Uh, why this mood? I, I, at this point, I can only speculate. I think sociologists probably would need to look at this more. I can only speculate that both Christmas and Eid al-Fitr are very family-centered holidays, very children-centered, uh, and people like uh, it might, there's some psychological evidence that people feel more predisposed for sex with giving and receiving of presents and things like that, you know? You know, the United States full of songs like Santa baby, give me a present, you know, so incubating, getting gifts at, at Christmas with sex and so forth. So there is maybe something in, in that feel-good spirit that I mo our, our mood feels, this giving feeling that makes people more predisposed for sex. Uh, that's a speculation. Our research does not point that. That's just me pointing this. But I'm asking. I think sociologists, anthropologists should look at those questions. Uh, so, so just, have you thought about putting alcohol consumption as one of the primary uh, drivers? Well, I bet any money that uh, <laughs> there'd be some well, good Granger causality certainly between. Certainly, uh, alcohol consumption would not happen in Muslim countries. Uh, no, but for the culture, Christian. Yeah. So, so it doesn't explain the results for Eid al Fitr. Um, but um, sure, alcohol, but it's not the only holiday that has, uh, 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 um, clearly it's not the only holiday that has a lot of alcohol consumption. Thanksgiving also has a lot of alcohol consumption. Oh yes, it does. I mean, if you come to my family, it has as much as Christmas. Uh, uh, I don't see any distinction in alcohol consumption in the United States between Thanksgiving and Christmas. If anything, uh, uh, Thanksgiving would have more because it has no religious undertones. It's a celebration that whether you're Muslim in the United States, whether you're Jewish, you celebrate Thanksgiving, whereas Christmas is only for Christians. So I would think Thanksgiving, if it were alcohol, if it were extra time, should even have a much stronger effect than Christmas on that. But at least it's something you can check. Or you have to. You could even look for Google Trends on uh, searches for alcohol. Sure. So I, you could yeah. look at national sales uh, as a function sure. of time of alcohol. Sure. I mean, this, this is an interesting thing. It's already known, uh, and I'll show you a little bit, it was already known that condom sales peak at Christmas more than at Thanksgiving. That, that's pretty well known, and, and it was a study done by the condom manufacturers. Um, and so those things are, were already known. I don't know about Thanksgiving, why it doesn't have the same. I suspect it's actually the gift giving. I mean, that's my, my assumption, is that at Thanksgiving we do not exchange gifts. At Easter we do not exchange gifts. Uh, and we do at Christmas, and that makes people feel more predisposed for sex. That's my 
assumption, but I don't know if I said it. So as we timed the release of this very well, of course, right? This came out, uh, uh, this is what, I don't know how I can't, you know, this is a video of all the media attention that this got, but uh, um, I think I would have to come here to, in order for this to happen. Tonight, we make love with only words. Girls first. Girls first. Okay, so at first I was going to tell you I saw your intelligent account of finance. And then I could tell you I could just smell your race cars forever in my pants. I really did trip it on the thought of being caught by somebody with the ugly to sell me Maybe I don't care. I would rip out my hair from the shirt and take your face. I don't want to make love to you. I just want to look at you. I just want to listen to you. I wasn't going to show this, but since it was, I was outed as a DJ before uh, on Twitter yesterday by, by Laura <laughs> from here, so I actually put some prints in. Um, all right, so this, the paper, of course, was released at Christmas, had a lot of attention. Uh, it was discussed. <laughs> It's just like completely slutting for media here. Uh, the, the, um, the, it was the hot topic on, on during Christmas. At re people, instead of searching for sex, were discussing the paper on Reddit. So it's the number one topic on Reddit. So you can see a lot of these discussions going on there. Um, the, um, it was already known. I mean, we actually made it to men's fitness, but this is a, it was already known by the condom uh, companies that you have a, a higher chance of having casual sex in Christmas than you have in other times of the year, for instance. Um, so this was already, there's a research that came out from this. Um, all right, so m moving on from this uh, work, let me show, so of course the work I showed has an interesting uh, public health in, in, uh, in, um, repercussion. So for instance, probably um, safe sex campaign should be peaking at Christmas, right? So and it is something you wouldn't think about uh, uh, in, in most places or, or eat out theater. And there's other, other things that you could think that of a public health interest. But you know, my group has been working a lot in, in biomedical research. So we, we've done other things with social media that have to do with public health and that re the research is just a, a little bit of it. So I'm gonna show you, a li this, this in particular is a collaboration with the Epilepsy Foundation of America via Wendy Miller, also at Indiana University. And basically, our approach to using social media for problems of public health interest is that we look at all these data sites, we, co we compute timelines, uh, time series data from, pay from whether it's mood, sentiment, or um, of individuals. We do dictionary matching, whether the one I just showed you was with, with moods, but we do it for uh, pharmaceuticals, symptoms, terms associated with cannabis. Right now we're using terms associated with the opioid crisis in the United States and so forth. We build co-mention networks and then we analyze them with different techniques that we develop to make predictions about things like drug interactions, the sim uh, drugs that may be interacting in negatively on your, uh, on your behavior. So this, I'm gonna talk about this work that I've done with Rion Correa on finding uh, drug interactions on Instagram um, and Twitter. This paper last year was considered one, uh, highlighted as one of the important papers of 2016 in precision medicine because we could potentially predict drug interactions be before doctors even know about them by tracking social media. So we've built a, a, a tool, Rion in particular built this tool. It's a beta tool if you want to go look at it online. Uh, symptom, it's called Symptom. Um, this is the URL where you can uh, search the networks we obtained from Instagram and now also Twitter. Um, so basically just to summarize this research, People do post a lot on Instagram about the drugs they're taking and what they've been, even though you might think they don't, they're, you, know, you wouldn't think you would do that, many people do. So for instance, this is in a post of somebody talking about taking Prozac, fluoxetine, um, and being diagnosed with depression. Uh, there are many of these, these are all photos from Instagram posts uh, that are, they are public, and you see people posting the photos of the pills they're taking or about to take in different languages, that's in Portuguese, um, uh, and, and so forth. So there's plenty of that data. So we went out on Instagram before the API was closed, though we still have this data set and we have, we're building a relationship with Instagram to, to do more. Uh, uh, we, have, we went to track seven depression drug 
hashtag. So we looked at all the posts on Instagram. This was the entire fire hose at the time. Uh, between 2010 and 2015 on any post that mentioned one of seven drugs of depression. And we then uh, matched against dictionaries of symptoms and other drugs. We went to look at other drugs they might be also hey. taking uh, to look at drug interaction. So we have three dictionaries uh, from the FDA, drug names and all its synonyms and so forth. Um, so we went out and looked. This is a timeline of that user uh, in time. And, and so you see a lot of activity in some days, some days less activity, how many posts uh, she has a day. And here are the, the matches of our dictionaries when they have what we consider an adverse effect and when we consider um, a drug that was mentioned. So we can follow all of this uh, and then we have timelines like this and then we can build cor correlation information in different sliding windows. So we used uh, weekly data, monthly data, and daily data, and build co-mentioned networks of how often uh, these certain terms co-occur in those time windows. So if you say you took a drug and then later you say you have a headache, this would you know, build networks based on that. So we built the co-mentioned networks. Uh, this is uh, the network for this case of the, of the drugs. Then we can do such things as spectral analysis of this. This is the first eigenvector of the network and you can see what the subnetworks are of the communities in, in Instagram that are talking about certain drugs. So for instance, this is a, a subnetwork that is very associated with the disease of psoriasis. So we, we, after a while, we can evaluate that there's a, a subpopulation using depression drugs on, on Instagram that is dealing with psoriasis. So, so this becomes a public health tool where analysts can come and see who is using these drugs? What are they doing? What are they talking about? Um, and so then you can query these networks. Our tool does that. So you can click on the edges and find out what, what are the people who are reporting this interaction, say, between stroke and seizures via a certain drug and so forth. And you can have nursing personnel and so forth evaluate this or do large scale prediction of drug interactions, which is what we did. Uh, so I'm not going into the details here. What we did is used a fact-checking algorithm we developed with Filippo Menzer and Alessandro Flamini and Johan Bowen, an automatic fact-checking algorithm that is somewhat based on, a, on this network um, um, idea that Tiago Simas and I had that was published in Network Science. So basically we look at shortest paths on networks and those that most break the triangle inequality. Uh, and those that make the triangle inequality are predicted as being potential missing information and so forth. Uh, and then we've, with that, we predicted uh, drug, drug symptom associations and possible drug interactions, and we've been validating them time, in time series. So we say, did social media report this, this interaction before the medical establishment? And so that's what we started doing in this paper and we're continuing to do for uh, Rion's dissertation. Um, so this shows a lot of the, the potential of social media to try to find things of, of medical relevance. Um, we have been lately, with, um, especially with the Epilepsy Foundation, we're doing more precise cohort studies. Um, one of the cohort studies we're doing right now with the Epilepsy Foundation is on Facebook. So there's this thing on epilepsy called sudden death in epilepsy, where people die unexpectedly, usually during their sleep with epilepsy, and we don't know what causes. So we are, the families of people who die that way donated their Facebook passwords to us via an app that we did. And so we have a cohort that we built, and we're trying to see if there were any signals in mood and so forth that point to these transitions that would maybe predict these diseases. So I'm doing this. This is a figure from Johan Bolen. So this is a collaboration with Johan Bolen, Wendy Miller, Ian Newton, Ingrid van der Lemput. Uh, and uh, this is a figure from Johan and Ingrid in which they were looking not at epilepsy, but at manic depression. This is a, a Twitter timeline. And you can see the mood changes uh, uh, that uh, the people have on social media. So this is sort of upcoming work where we're using social media to try to help in the prediction of certain uh, conditions. Um, 
which probably raises a lot of ethical reason, uh, things um, to talk about. How much time do I have? Ten, ten minutes. Okay, so I'll go very quickly, uh, changing topic to end. Oh, for questions. So I'm going to, I don't need questions like the other guys. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, I, 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 I like that. Que I, I like questions, but um, let me tell you a little about uh, very quickly about um, electronic health records. So um, with Rion Correa, we got all the data from the public system of in Blumenau, in Santa Catarina, in the in the south of. Okay, this is better? Okay. Uh, there are drugs that um, are known to be interactions. You go to the database drug bank and you know they interact. So doctors should not be prescribing those unless they have a big reason. But we go and see, even in public health systems where all doctors have easy access to the information system, a lot of these drugs are still being prescribed together. And we wanted to know how much of that is happening. Uh, because it's not clear how much of that is happening. So we go around and look at all these data and, ma and match when known drug-drug uh, uh, interactions are being prescribed uh, to patients in this entire city of Brazil. Um, and I'm just going to give you the gist of it. Um, we have the number of administrations is how many drugs, and this is in age, uh, and this is the probability that you get a drug. The yellow line is a co-administration that you get at least two drugs at the same time, which of course increases with age. And then you have the uh, prescription of drugs that you know are actually known interactions that shouldn't be prescribed and how they are uh, uh, happening um, in, in time. So you can see with age these increase. There's a lot more for females than males, but there's also a lot more females in the system than males. So we wanted to know if there was a bias on this, uh, a gender bias in terms of, um, of the risk of you being prescribed a, dr a known drug interaction on age and males. And to summarize it, yes, there is a bias. Um, and I'll show you some points. So in age, uh, your risk of getting a known drug interaction increases almost 50-fold from the time you were born to the time you're 70 years old. That's just in age. So you have a much higher risk in age. Of course, you're getting a lot more drugs. But the probability of just getting more drugs or, or having a co-administration doesn't grow that much. So he made a lot of null models that show that this increase is not just because you're being given more drugs, but it's because the drugs are, are either more dangerous or they're not available or people don't care about old people. I don't know. I mean, and, and they, don't, they don't care. I mean, all of these could be, could be factors. Um, we looked at the gender ratio and there is indeed a much higher risk of being given uh, a drug-drug interaction that is known to females and males. That's almost 20 twi 22 times higher when you're uh, between 50 and 60, that a woman will receive a well-known drug interaction versus a man in this data. It's interesting, when we started looking at data as data, we thought it would be because of the, uh, the, the, the hormones and all that, that for, for birth for birth control, but it is, and it does not happen in the period of age, um, where, of childbearing age. You do have more, greater co-administration there, but you don't have as much risk. This happens post-menopause, that's when women are given uh, higher drugs. Um, so we looked at what are these drugs. I'm going to go. The, I'm going to go over the. No, not going to talk much about the null models here, just to show that it's not a matter of you getting more drugs. Um, and we looked just to finalize at the network of drugs that uh, is most responsible. And the red edges are female, a higher risk for females, and the uh, uh, blue ones are uh, risk for males. 
and you can see most of what increases the, the risk for females are actually anti-anxiety drugs and antidepressive drugs that are being prescribed with well-known repercussions. They interact, for instance, with, um, with uh, anti-reflux medication that it's well known, but men are not being prescribed. Although there could be many sociological reasons for that. Either the doctors don't care as much for females as males, that's a possibility, or women go more to the doctor to, um, to complain about depression and anxiety than men. There could be another social factor in that, that uh, in, in this city. So, but uh, the point of this is this kind of research allows you to identify these, these types of biases, then, then you, can, you can go study um, the, um, the data. We can see what are the drugs. Some of these are quite major. Some of the drugs that are being prescribed, just to give you an example, fluoxetine is Prozac and amitriptyline. That's a major drug interaction. In the paper, we explore how much this probably costs. The, the, uh, we make an estimate of how much this costs the medical system because these people who have major interactions prescribed probably go back to the hospital. Um, so that it's staggering. And we also, there's only one study that did something similar, but not at this scale, much smaller. We did it for two years. There's a study in Scotland and the numbers we find are co coherent with the numbers found in Scotland, uh, but they only did it for two weeks where we have data for two years. Um, so um, I'll finish here then. So for some questions, thank you. If there's some. You said you don't need any questions, but I will ask an eigen question. <laughs> now that you've taught us, I have the eigen mood for that. So, it, you know, your research uh, brings to mind the uh, big uh, scandals that have happened now with the manipulation of, of the vote and Cambridge technology and so on. So I would like to know your opinion about that. You are listening now to these people, but you are not trying to, to give them information to manipulate their, their opinions. What, what is your, uh, I mean, with your data, you could also identify political uh, uh, positions and you could probably feed them, as apparently has been done in the Brexit and in the U.S. election? Sure. Uh, I have colleagues at Indiana University who focus more on the political questions, like Filippo Mincer's group have been looking at the spread of fake news and that sort of thing using this kind of data. I focus more on biomedical reasons. Now, unlike Facebook and, other, and uh, Cambridge Analytics and so forth, every piece of research that I showed you he has to pass a board, right, an ethics board permission. So I'm funded by NIH, so this study has an IRB approval. Every single one of them has an IRB approval. So as part of IRB approvals, I'm not allowed to, you know, to, to. so for instance, one that I thought they wouldn't approve, it turns out was the easiest one, is the Facebook one with the families that donated the, 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 the timelines of, of dead people. Because they're dead, they're all automatically exempt from IRB approval. So that's, for, for instance, an easy way to do this kind of research. But I would hope it would predict future, if we have that, eventually, if we find a good signal, which we, we seem like we're finding, then, then the ethical question would be, will I, how, will I warn people that suffer of, 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 of uh, of epilepsy about these issues, what do I do then? It would have to be a, a, a bigger study. In terms of political ones, now I'm not, I personally am not planning on interfering on any of that, but I leave that to, to Phil Mincer and those other guys. <laughs> Thank you.